So, Wendy, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Stan for letting us come today, and I apologize for the allergies in my voice. I think everybody here has probably got a little bit of that lately. But um, I'm here today as a representative of Postal Weight in Netterville. We are a tax counting, a test services, and consulting firm in Baton Rouge, Metairie, and seven other locations. And so I wanted to go through, in a very short amount of time, some things that we do to help our restaurant and hospitality clients that I think might be very beneficial to you. So a little bit about Postal Weight in Netterville. 65-year-old firm. We're in seven locations, nine locations in the top 100 accounting firms. We have got um, people that help in all sorts of areas for our business clients, whether it's tax, accounting, technology, and consulting, which is what we're going to talk about today. We do something that's very, very unusual. We have a very holistic approach when we work with our clients because we find that many times <clears throat> it's more than just one area of the business that needs attention. So when we work through these things, we get into consulting, which is where I am. The consulting role wears a lot of different hats, just like you guys do. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. The way we do it is very, very unique. We get involved with our clients at the base level, and we talk about people, processes, and technology. Because what we find is it's not always just one area. <clears throat> We get in and we start looking at things like employee behavior. We look at things that escalate up to the law firm. So when you get in touch with Michelle and Steve, you need to be prepared because they're going to do the best they can when you're prepared. Today's special for you guys is all about risk management. These are things that I think you guys, Steve, you and Michelle touched on these very, very broadly and giving them some great information. When we work with our clients, <clears throat> and I'm able to speak a little bit better, we get in and talk to you about how do you deal with these things on a day-to-day -day basis? What does your infrastructure look like? What is it like when you hear these things being talked about in the restaurant, in the office, among your customers? Things that get your attention, I get harassed every day. Um, don't want to get anybody fired, but some of the things that Michelle touched on earlier. He keeps asking me out, what do I do? I don't know who to talk to. If you don't have human resources in your organization, I strongly encourage you, don't go to bed tonight until you figure out a way to make a good business case to get the help you need. We work with quite a few of you in the audience here, and I'm really glad to see you here today. You guys know that these things happen every single day. It's, it's an integral part of dealing with people. That's what we do. You're in the restaurant hospitality business. You're with people all day long. These things happen all day long. The compliance side. So I like to talk a lot about preparation. My job as a consultant is to make you be the best prepared client that can ever call Michelle and Steve. So when it comes to that documentation, to the paperwork, to making sure you're onboarding your employees correctly, the I-9 forms, the employment paperwork, all of those things that go into rolling up to asking for legal advice. So I am not a labor attorney, nor do I play one in my videos. I know where that line is drawn, and it's very important that we keep that line in place. These things come up day to day, and if you're shooting from the hip and you really don't have good procedures in place, you haven't trained the managers that are funneling these things up to the CFO, the CEO, the general manager, whomever. You're going to get different decisions made with different people involved, and guess what? We're human. So the decision I make may be different than the decision my partner makes. Now you potentially have some discrimination. Now it rolls up the hill to legal. We want to help you not have to go that far if you can. Those policies and procedures that were talked about as well. If you have your handbook, do people actually know how to use it? Do you have the right information in the handbook? If you're in multiple states and you have multiple locations, does everybody have the same version? 
Are those versions legal? Have they been looked at it by Labor Council? Have they been looked at? All of the things that go into that on the day-to-day -day attendance issues. How do people call in when they're going to be late? What happens if they use their cell phone when they're working? What do those policies look like? If you don't get that stuff in front of your employees, how do you really expect to hold them accountable to it? Turn that around for just a minute. Would you want to be held accountable to something that you had never seen in print, never had presented to you so that you understood how to deal with it, and really didn't know who to go talk to if you had a problem? That's the kind of in the weed stuff that Post Away to Netterville is great at. We get down in there and we help you lay that groundwork to make sure that when it gets up to legal, they're ready and they can look at it and say, this is going to be a slam dunk because you've got all your ducks in a row. On the administration side, there's a lot of transactional day-to-day -day things that take place. You know that. Recruiting is probably, wouldn't y'all say, one of the hardest things to do in the restaurant business? I mean, it's like a revolving door, right? And there's so much paperwork and so much documentation. If you don't have good technology and good systems to make that seamless, st steps get skipped, especially if you have numerous people involved in the process. If technology is a problem, if the reporting that you get from the technology is non-existent, if it's difficult for you to do all of these tasks because you don't have skilled or qualified human resources people helping you, that's the trifecta for disaster. That's the last thing you want. When you need help, there are ample people within the LRA to help you. It's amazing what you guys have available to you as a member of this organization. So you can go to the NRA's website and get a lot of good information, education, helpful tips. I've been looking at it the last few days and it's really very good. You get to your own membership here with the LRA, the resources and information that is available to you is really tremendous. Um, legal guidance is there when you need it. In between your resources, your education and information is le and legal is where Post Away to Netterville can fill in for you. We can be the boots on the ground, we can be the staff augmentation, we can be your outsourced service provider, whether it's in HR, technology, processes, whatever you need. Somebody's got to get in there and get the grunt work done, and we're really good at that. I love this stuff. Don't know why, it's just a thing. I really like it. I like it getting organized. I like it so that you can do your job and get out of these weeds. This is how we do it. It's a real d detailed process that we go through, and we find it very helpful because it's interactive with you. We don't come in there and look around and say, okay, this is what you need to do, and send you a great big bill. We get in there with you, and we work through all of the details. The first thing we start with is an assessment. What is going on? Where are your pain points? Where do we see risk? Where do we see opportunities for improvement? What's the culture like? What is going on that you need to get fixed right now? And then we'll put together a plan for you. And all of this goes to some of those compliance things that make sure you're on the right track to start with. Getting the files straight, getting the I-9s done. How many people love to do I-9 forms? Right? It's difficult. I mean, I think they're self-defeating the form itself. Those things can cost you money if they're wrong. So you need to make sure that you have a system and a procedure in place and people are trained. If you have a lot of turnover in your administrative group, so the person doing onboarding and I-9s yesterday is not there tomorrow, and oh well, somebody left some notes, so we'll just do it the way she did it or he did it, and that was wrong. So now you're just building a hill, and it's going to be a long ride down, I can tell you. So building that infrastructure is what we do, whether it's manual processes, technology, doesn't really matter. We need to see what you need so that we can help you build it. Once we understand what your needs are in that assessment, then we can come up with a roadmap. Then we can come up with a plan that you can develop and implement and do it in stages because you don't want to roll out a bunch of changes all at once. That's hard. It's hard on employees. It's really hard on the administrative staff. But looking at all of those things that build who you are, whether you need a compensation plan, total reward system, what do your benefits look like? What does your comp structure look like? How is your tipping going? Um, do you have management involved in that? Are you following the rules the right way? All of those things that go into the developmental piece. 
do you have the right system to control all of this data? Is it secured? Do you have paper files scattered in five file cabinets in four different restaurants? Love that one. That's tough to get your arms around. You guys have reporting requirements to do for equal employment, your EEO forms. If you don't have all of that applicant and employee data in your system where you can quickly and accurately generate those forms and reports, you're going to have a problem come reporting time. So we look at systems. We look at who's getting the data, how it's coming in, how it's being managed, collected, secured, and then how you can best use it. Once we know the wheels are firmly on the bus, and not until, then we start looking at postal weight transitioning out. Do you need to, us to help you recruit for an HR person? Do you need to keep us on board in kind of a staff augmentation role? Do you need one of our accountants to come in and work with you periodically? Or a new system selection or implementation? So our team works together. It's not just HR. I've always been a firm believer that it's never just human resources when it comes to trying to get a company going right. Yes, we deal with the human side and the employees all day long. But the key is that all of these pieces have to work very, very cohesively to make this function so that you're not driving yourself crazy all day long. You guys have other things to do. So making sure that we put that secondary piece, that plan in place that makes sense for you and that can continue when we're there to help you periodically or when we're gone. The really cool thing about what we do, especially in the human resources arena, is we work a lot with organizations that have a full HR team. Those of you who do payroll or accounting or recruitment or HR functions know that you really can't tackle big projects along with the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on. So we can come in and supplement and help you do those big projects. We've never done an audit of our employment and I-9 files, and we've got 4,000 to go through. We'll never do that, but we know that that is a ticking time bomb. We can come in and do that. We do that a lot. We compile the information, we train you on the right process, and then we'll get in touch with legal with you to say, hey, this is what we found. We need a legal opinion now to make sure that these guys know what to do, whether they should try to fix this stuff, leave it as is, keep moving, that's where we pass, the, pass it over to Michelle and Steve. So keep in mind that we're kind of the middle ground to help you when you're in the weeds, getting all of this stuff pulled together. We had a very short time for me to speak to you today, and again, I appreciate your patience with my voice problems I'm having. Um, I'm gonna be here for questions and answers in a little while. If you need to get in touch with me, we have some really good materials in the back. I encourage you to pick them up. Um, Wendy, I think you said you're going to send the slides out to everyone. And so anything that we can help you with, again, my name is Helene Wall. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thanks right. so much. Thanks, Helene. <laughs> All right, John O'Brien, come on down. John O'Brien. John O'Brien is with Arthur J. Gallagher, and he's been working with our association for a number of years. And he's going to talk to us about the best topic. The best topic Absolutely. insurance coverages you may want to consider. All right, let's see if we're good here. Everyone can hear me. All right. Um, I'm John O'Brien. I'm with Arthur J. Gallagher. Uh, we're an insurance brokerage firm, uh, it's a worldwide company. Uh, we have about 24,000 employees. Uh, we do a, a little over $5 billion in uh, revenues. And I have been insuring restaurants for quite a while, since 1987 uh, in New Orleans. Um, many of the local restaurants are, are my customers. And um, I'm going to try to help you walk through quickly, like going through Algebra 3 insurance for uh, employment practices liability. And I thank the Restaurant Association and all of you. Uh, during mental weakness, I have part, uh, participated in some ownership in some restaurants. It's much harder than insurance. I can I assure you that. Boy, I'm, I don't, don't know why I did that, but, but uh, I've certainly learned the industry more than I wanted to. Um, qualifications. I have been doing uh, employment practices liability insurance since 1997. We started a program uh, in San Francisco in a joint venture with New Orleans. And the program has grown in the 21 years to cover about 25,000 locations uh, nationwide. We currently 
have about 350,000 uh, restaurant employees in the program. And I'm just going to go through you what I've seen since uh, one of the Harveys, Harvey Weinstein, my two Harveys, Hurricane Harvey and Harvey Weinstein changed, my, uh, changed insurance. So uh, what we see in, in employment practice liability are example, we're going to go through a few examples of actual uh, claims, uh, typical claims, what is an EPL insurance policy, what and how do we protect my businesses from civil rights violations, general insurance conditions and usual limits, important policy coverages and costs, listing, listing of, what am I doing, I'll come back, listing of uh, Louisiana EPL insurers that you can go to or have your agent go to. I'm going to give you our go-to insurance companies and what has always been competitive for us so that you can go to your agent and probably get the best quality uh, coverage at the lowest cost. And just resources that your employment practices liability insurers will provide you as buying their policy. It's free resources, 800 numbers, human resources uh, types of uh, tools, uh, Spanish, English, those type of things. So here we go. Uh, going next. All owners, this is what I've seen, all owners, executives of insurance companies are now like celebrities. I don't care if you're in Franklinton, Monroe, or New Orleans. You are a celebrity. What comes out of your mouth is very important. The media is looking for you. They're looking for you to try to sell papers. They're looking for you to see if anything has gone wrong because what we've seen, and as we saw today, just look at the Mississippi State coach and uh, the Ford, Ford, Motor person, Ford Motor Company uh, president stepping down because he had sexual misconducts. The media is out fishing for you, and you are a celebrity in your community. I don't care how big or small it is. You are a celebrity, and they're looking for you. And you have to look at yourself like that and understand whatever you do, whatever action you have, it can have an impact. Um, brand management. EPL has now become brand management. In other words, your restaurant is a brand. No matter, again, even if it's in a small community, everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows what your restaurant is. And if you don't take the proper steps to protect yourself and do the right things, not to have violations, you're going to hurt your brand. And then you can hurt it, you can devastate it. it it's been bone crushing. I've been involved in three of the major sexual harassment restaurateur issues in the nation. And, and it's been, it was brutal. So you are trying to manage your brand, and by doing the proper steps, your brand will continue on. Moral ter turpitude. I'm seeing a lot of this out of New York. Um, if you have contracts, mortgages, leases, if you're a franchisee, if you're in a hotel, there's a, there's a little clause usually in those contracts, which is moral turpitude, which means they can immediately terminate your contract because you've had allegations of sexual harassment. And in New York, which is a state which we insure many restaurants, if people have favorable leases, they're looking to terminate contracts. You could have your loan called sometimes because of a moral turpitude contract because of a sexual harassment allegation. It's very important that you take what Steve and Michelle did and put that into practice because at the end result, you could lose a lot. Um, owners and executives are held to a much higher standard. I, mean, I, can't, I can't tell you what I've been through. No taxes, no emails, no Snapchat, no Facebook, no, suck, no, no discussions, nothing involving sexual type issues or anything with your employees. Just can't happen. Cannot happen, cannot happen, uh, because it will ultimately hurt you. Um, you have, there will be consequences. Weigh the consequences of getting romantically involved with any employee in your organization. It is a serious, serious decision. The sensitivity of the media and the courts and the EEOC is at the highest that I've seen it in 22 years. You do not generally want to do that. It's a major consequence, and we tell our clients, if you're involved in something, you better have, sit down and discuss and weigh what the consequences and your exposures are because they could be significant, and you've seen what's happened in the media. It is a serious, serious issue. You're probably putting your brand at risk, and you can put everything you've worked for for 20, 30, 40 years at risk. Uh, there, we have not seen a significant increase in severe large claims. It's media driven. We, we, we have 25,000 restaurants covered. 
our, our large claims continue to be sort of in the same pattern. You're seeing a lot of media-driven issues related to it, but when it comes to actually reviewing what the losses are and how much they have actual quantified factual evidence of things that we're going to pay, fine, it, pay on, it's not as big as we, we had anticipated. We are seeing uh, a frequency of nonsense claims. I mean, we are seeing nonsense claims literally probably doubled. Every week we're seeing things, oh, I bumped, uh, a, a server was bumped in, in her breast by, uh, her breast by a waiter. Uh, she put in a claim. You know, those, those type of things are just coming. It's nonsense claims. And uh, I think that will go away with the tide when the media hype uh, goes down. Let me just tell you, there will always be back of the house, front of the house, on the line talk. And we know that. Your insurers know that. The courts know that. This is something that you're not going to eliminate. When we go in and we talk to people who have these large claims and they have the EEOC charges and everything and they're just freaking out because they think that they're going to be paying hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, it's the nature of the beast. And you all know that it's, you're not going to eliminate a lot of that line talk. It's just it's part of it. You do your best, you control it, you do what you do it, you know, with the documentation following your attorneys and your, your human resources, but it, we know it can't be eliminated. Um, you talk about tip sharing, that's a big deal. The, you know, follow your attorneys and whatnot about tip sharing. Never do anything off the clock. Stop any cash payment. Uh, try not to do favoritism, and, and again, communication is vitally important between you, you and your staff. These are some just recent lawsuits that we've had. Um, a restaurant in the French Quarter, um, 200,000 for race discrimination because of jokes. It was jokes. Kitchen jokes, kitchen jokes, uh, uh, African American jokes, and uh, it was prevalent. They made, they made the, uh, you know, they made the supervisor aware. They didn't stop. Uh, ended up three hundred twelve thousand uh, dollars. New Orleans restaurant, uh, um, Fair Labor Standard Act class action lawsuit in New Orleans restaurant bar. Um, tip pooling issues. It was tip pooling again issues, and it wasn't proper notification of the uh, tax credit. Uh, the owners ended up having to pay $250,000. There was over $100,000 worth of defense uh, costs and, and attorney's costs related to that. Uh, Baton Rouge restaurant, uh, sexual harassment, allowing sexual discussions, touching and things going on. Uh, we ended up paying up with the $450,000 for that loss. Um, this is a paraplegic man sues numerous, it was numerous restaurants. This wheelchair-bound paraplegic man was targeting restaurants that were not ADA compliant. And he would go in, he would tell them, he would write the letter. Many of them didn't respond. Uh, he would put in an EEOC claim, and of course they weren't ADA compliant, and ultimately you've got, you've got you, there's some violations, so we ended up paying that, and he got tens and tens of thousands of dollars from numerous locations that he targeted and found out about. Um, this is, you know, the huge one. This was a, a, a discrimination in, in Georgia, $8.7 million, actively discriminating, African Americans being actively discriminated against. It was known they were doing it on purpose and they didn't do anything about it and, and they, were, they got crushed. And so did we. Um, typical claims, restaurant owners, uh, I think you've been through this race discrimination, hostile environment. The, the, new, the new buzzword you're going to get is uh, um, men mental trauma. It's mental trauma. I, I, I had um, you know, the discrimination, the jokes, or the harassment, or the, the being cornered to a sexual talk is giving me mental trauma. And that's what we're seeing a lot of the basis of some of our, our uh, claims in litigation. Sexual harassment, hostile, wrong, uh, hostile environment again, wrongful termination, equal pay violations, failure to promote, noncompliance with the American Disabilities Act. Uh, again, the mental trauma keeps going on. Uh, third parties, you can have third parties, your vendors, your guests, your clients that actually you have some clients that have, you know, demand the same servers each time. And if they're stating different things, you know, you know, Betty, I really like you, you have a beautiful body, you know, I really like to go out with you, and they bring those things up, man, you've got to address those issues, and you have to address them with your clients because it is an absolute violation of their civil rights. Uh, failure to hire due to discrepancy, um, ADA access, which we went through with the wheelchair individual. 
What is employment practices liability insurance? It's an insurance that provides the funding to cover the legal costs and settlement of claims related to civil rights violations. Um, EPL insurance provides resources to support your human resource, resources department to help your business to comply with civil rights laws. So it's basically transferring the risk. We hire the attorneys and the, uh, we pay the settlements and judgments should you be uh, found to be uh, guilty of violation. EPL is a controllable exposure. This isn't like a hurricane fire or anything. If you follow what your attorneys do or pulse the weight and edible, this is controllable. You will not be in violation. If you do what you're supposed to do, your, your claim will not escalate to some massive amount. If you have the proper documentation, so you have the correct employment applications, you have the correct handbooks and compliance with current and state for laws, you get with Steve or Michelle and your attorney makes sure that they're reviewed properly, you have a, a, an EPL insurance. You, I split my exposures. Again, when I'm sitting with any of my restaurant clients, I sort of see it in two ways. You have your back of the house and front of the house employees, which are your hourly workers. It, because there's an enormous amount of turnover usually in that, what I harp on with my clients is to make sure you have that documentation. Have that documentation. Did they sign the handbook? Is the handbook in, in, in compliance? Did you have the proper uh, application? Is this sexual harassment thing? Is it all signed? Because within two years, usually half of them are gone, but they can come back to you years later. And if you don't have that documentation, it's very difficult to do that. Then I look at your managers, management, executive, and owners. And when I document training, 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 and family and spouses are included in that. A lot of my claims involve family coming on the premises and doing things because their, their dad, son, sister, the, the wife comes on and she's doing things. It's very important that they're included because they can create serious issues in your restaurant. And they have, and it's been very difficult sometimes telling, hey, Don, don't come in and you can't tell the employees you know, what to do in these instances. So your spouse and family have to be involved because it can cost you hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and numerous amounts of time getting documentation and discovery and everything else. And of course, purchase the proper insurance. That's always, always a good thing. Uh, EPL general conditions limit. I'm not trying to go too deep. EPL insurance is a little different in that uh, you have to be aware that the defense costs of your attorney lower your limit. Most insurance policies don't do that. So when you're selecting a limit, you have to account for generally your claim is going to be at least 50 to 60 percent attorney's fees and that lowers your limit. So there, it's very expensive to go through some of these things so when you're selecting a limit remember that other insurance policies they're unlimited in EPL it reduces it. EPL policies are claims made. Your policy has to be alive and in force for you to make a claim. If you stop that policy and let it expire it's done unless you do some extended advice some other things. You cannot put in a claim a year later. You're, it's over with. You're on your own. Switching from an EPL, one EPL insurance company to travelers, to, to uh, farmers, whatever, is a complex transaction because you have to have um, extension of deadlines and retroactive dates that you have to work out with your agent. So when you're changing insurance, Make sure that you work with your agent to get through the proper extensions and deadlines or else you could be left holding the bag and there's no coverage. EPL insurance can normally be bought in limits of 300, 500, a million, two million, and that's about it. Over two million, you have to get into some complex groupings and whatnot because I, we have clients that have 15, 20 million, but it, it, it's much harder. It's hard to get the higher limits and you have to sort of group LLCs together and ownership and it gets a little bit more uh, complex. But generally speaking, most of our clients, most of our policies are 500,000 or a million, generally speaking, out of the 25,000 restaurants that we cover. Um, important policy terms and cost paid. EPL policies, the application that you sign is a warranty. So you better make darn sure you hit those questions correct because when you have that big claim, that plaintiff attorney is going to blow that application up and make it 24 feet in front of that courtroom and they're going to say, Michelle, did you answer this square yes and it's actually no and it's going to be hurt. It's a warranty application and if you don't answer those questions accurately, it can void coverage and it's, a, it's part of the policy where other auto insurance and other things, it's not part of the policy. So it's a warranty application. 
be sure your policy includes in the, these three endorsements. Third party, again, that third party is for any other person wording any other person. So if any other person comes in and harasses, discriminates, says jokes or whatever it is, and your employee feels that their civil rights are violated, you have coverage. And probably 25% of our claims are from the beer guy, delivery guy, and the plumber, and the electrician. So you must have that coverage. It's worth it. It's a couple, you know, a few more dollars, but it's worth it. Raise your deductible on your property insurance and buy it. Wage and hour, um, it's, you can get only defense for that, but obviously we're seeing an increase in wage and hour. We went through that, the, the, the French Quarter place that had a significant wage and hour loss, and I've had, we, that we're seeing an increase. God knows, certainly don't go to California, but it's out of control out there. Uh, and the immigration uh, uh, extension. So if you have uh, people who aren't um, properly documented, will the insurance will pay up to fifty one hundred thousand to defend you for the violation of, of that name insured includes again spouses and family members i can't harp on that more we have so many spouses and family members who are truly maybe even not employees that create losses for the restaurant uh cause uh clause for defense defense counsel selection i highly recommend that your local attorneys whoever like steve or michelle are usually better well-versed in the courts and what's going on in New Orleans versus we had um, a large claim here in New Orleans and we had some attorney out in New York and it just, it did not work out. Boy, it did not work out. So there's a clause in the policy if you, if you tell your agent, I just want to make sure I can select my own defense counsel, they'll be, they'll be uh, usually approved by your insurer. And then the definition of defense costs it needs to be reviewed, especially if, you, if you're a larger restaurant because the defense costs lower the limit there's a clause in there that says how the defense costs are calculated and sometimes you get screwed because guess what, insurers are not, sometimes not the most scrupulous things, you, people you want to deal with. So watch out for those defense costs. Cost of policy based, is based on full-time and part-time workers. Um, again, these policies start out from the, the most minimal cost, probably $1,700 a year for $300,000 and of course they can get up to you know, tens of thousands with thousands and we have people with two, 3,000 employees. Full-time, part-time workers, make sure you include your interns and leaves. Uh, make sure that it's a duty to defend. That's important versus indemnification. That means the insurance company has to defend you, no matter what, while they're doing discovery, while they're researching it, while you're getting all this documentation together. Their attorneys have to be on staff defending you versus indemnifi indemnification language that says you're going to pay the money first and the insurance company is going to reimburse you. Yeah, that's a great deal. John. Um, yeah. I hate to stop you, yeah, yeah. but to keep us on schedule. Okay, this, these are the insurance companies right here. You can pick this up. And these are, this is a great chart for all the 800 numbers and what that you can get from the insurance companies. Thank you very much. So all of John's, uh, John's presentation is on the back table. Uh, Postal Weight in Netterville has information as does Philip, Fisher and Phillips on the back of, I uh, say Fisher and Phillips still, it's Fisher Phillips. Um, on the back table, as well as some information from the LRA about the different things that we offer. But if you have any questions right now, um, if Helene and Michelle and Steve and uh, John, uh, for John, you can go ahead and ask them. Um, we, are, we have videoed this for future viewing by you and your other employees, and we will send you the PowerPoint presentation. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, we will email. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. Hi. I have a tip pool bar environment, and my question is if my trainers are paid an hour, a higher hourly rate than everyone else in the bar, is there a legal concern there? Say that again. You have, you have trainers. Yeah. And bar trainer and service trainers get a higher hourly rate than the rest of staff. Okay. Is there a concern that they're on the same level of tip pool with everyone else? Well, you, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say as long as they're, you know, we can, we can look at those trainers and say they're not supervisory or management personnel, as long as they're employees, yes, that's fine. You can pay them a higher uh, rate and you're not going to have an issue with your tip pool in that regard. <clears throat> Is my mic still on? My mic? Yes, sir. There's lots of issues about uh, 50 employees 
or more. If I have 65 employees operate a hotel and a restaurant under the same business, if I was to subsell that restaurant or lease it, would I be now with 20 rest motel employees and 40 restaurant employees, would I be two separate employers? If I sell the business out completely to someone else. Are you managing the, uh, and manage, all the- Manage everything. You're still First, managing everything. Yes. Do you have people that go, that but, are shared you know, from, employees? From all these issues, it seems that you're a lot better off you got less than 50 employees. Well, this will, well, particularly with FMLA. Only for insurance. FMLA. I mean, that's only for FMLA. Even, even if someone, you're still covered under the ADA if you have 15 employees, and if somebody had a disability that required them to have a period of absence for reasonable accommodation, you, you would still have to do it. So it's, when she hit 50, FMLA is your additional obligation. But you. there's, you're still on the hook for It doesn't for all eliminate all civil yeah, rights. It doesn't, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everything the else still applies. Care yeah. Act. That's so, a whole different animal. Yeah. But but I would have to know more. I would have to know more in order to know whether we have to. You would have to aggregate, aggregate. those employees. Right. Good thought. But let me. There's a, a few things that, as I was sitting here, while we wait to see if there's any more questions, a few things that I wrote down to remember to say. Two of them piggyback on this last presentation. Again, if you have counsel that you're using or you want to use Fisher and Phillips, you've got to make sure they're either on the panel for the insurer or you can write them in because it is really unfortunate when we have worked with a business to tee up a situation and an EEOC charge comes in, they go, nope, sorry, you didn't pick Fisher Phillips when you signed your policy for EPL and now it's gotta go down the street to someone else who doesn't know you, doesn't know your business and doesn't know the facts of the claim. You're, and a lot of times you end up paying twice because you've already paid your, your regular lawyers to help you and now you gotta pay somebody else to learn everything all over again. The other thing is the wage and hour rider. A lot of these policies do expressly exclude it unless you get it included and you are more likely to be sued for wage and hour claims than you are, in my experience, than the harassment discrimination right now because the wage and hour is so easy. It's like you either paid the person right or you didn't. You either have the documents to back it up or you don't. And these cases are so easy for the plaintiff's lawyers because they know they're gonna get their fees if they get one penny for their client. They're gonna get their fees. They're almost always pled as a collective action, so it's not one server that's suing you. It's a collection of servers that are going to sue you for the last three years. And they'll make you go back years. And you go back three years is the maximum on a federal claim. Every check you paid. And and it's it's in those cases are always more expensive to litigate than they are to settle or that they end up costing you in the end. And even if all you have is a hundred thousand dollar cost of defense policy and you had to pay a ten thousand dollar retention, it is worth its weight in gold because I'm telling you, you will spend that kind of money. So make sure your EPL has that wage in our rider. A couple other things you need to know under the new tax law. Sexual harassment settlements with a confidentiality provision can no longer be written off on your taxes. Um, so that's a, that was a, a little known thing that sort of slid under the radar. And other things that were brought up in the last presentation about the ADA compliance. So this is your Title III compliance, meaning you know, do you have compliant bathrooms, do you have ramping and parking spots. I handle a lot of those cases here for restaurant owners. And again, they are super easy. They don't have to go to the EEOC first. They don't even have to really be a customer. They can literally roll by your restaurant. They can go in to use your bathroom. And then before you know it, you've got a lawsuit from a lawyer. They haven't even told you there was a problem. And the thing that's attractive about these lawsuits is that there's no money to the plaintiff because they're not injured. The money goes to the plaintiff's lawyers. That's what this is about, their attorney's fees and costs. And so typically it's something simple like your light switch was too high, your mirror was too high, you don't have your sink, your pipes wrapped under your sink, you have knobs on your doors and, and your faucets instead of the levered handles. Mm -hmm. It's things that are easy, easy, easy to fix and restaurants and businesses are being sued all over the state. There are a couple of real common cast of characters. They don't like to see my name on the other side because they know who I am but we do handle these cases, and so that's another thing that we can help you get in compliance with. One and, thing, oh, sorry, I'm ahead. sorry, Michelle. One thing I wanted to mention too, someone did mention to me, remember last year there was a lot of noise being made about the overtime rule change yes. and what constituted that threshold before overtime would kick in for certain employees? We know that was put on hold, it's not dead, it's gonna come back at some point, 
but making sure that you understand what your compensation structure is for those people you consider exempt from overtime is a real thing that takes some digging around and making sure you've got all your ducks in a row and the job duties in place and the salary policy. So don't forget about that because it could come back and your general managers and those supervisory roles are going to be impacted by that. So don't forget about that little And that's something that the LRA, I don't know if you remember when that was hot um, last, last fall, that was something that we were sending out constant information on um, and waiting for the, I think it was in December, we were supposed to get the- um, November. November, yeah. we were supposed to get the final- Final ruling. And so, that got delayed. So here's the status on that right now. So the comment period closed in September of 17. Um, they are now projecting that we will not have anything on that until October of 18. And, uh, and what are you guessing? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the minimum salary level is going to $33,000. Well, Acosta said during his appointment hearings he thought somewhere in the $30,000 range, so somewhere in between the four fifty-five dollars and the nine thirteen dollars a week. But here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter what you're paying these people. If you have them improperly classified as exempt from the under the job duties test, it doesn't matter whether you're paying them the right salary because just because you pay someone's salary does not mean they're exempt from overtime. And I do a lot of advice with collegiate sororities on paying employees and whether they're exempt or not exempt. And, and this is a common issue where just because someone has the same job title as somebody else doesn't mean they're doing the same thing, doesn't mean they're going to meet the test for exemption. So we, you know, from the pay perspective, yes, we need to know what they're going to set that pay at. Um, and there's still a debate whether or not the Department of Labor has the right to even set the pay, because that is still being litigated. Um, but assuming that they can set the pay, we don't need to wait for that to happen. We can be getting our ducks in a row right now and making sure that our people who are classified as exempt are proper, because there are lots of suits around the countries with assistant managers. Assistant managers are typically not going to be exempt, but lots of restaurants and businesses have been classified improperly as exempt. Yeah, let me put it differently. So my client calls and says, a little bit differently, says, Steve, well, I don't have to pay this person overtime because I pay him a salary. I'm like, well, that's good you pay them a salary, but what are their duties? What are they doing? And so they go, well, what are you talking about? And we find out that they don't meet one of the duties tests. The common ones are executive, administrative, professional, and there's, there's some others uh, uh, for exemption. So just, again, don't take out of this that it just because you're paying someone a salary right. that you don't have to pay them overtime. Right. There are three parts to that test. The yeah. yeah, multiple parts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The salary is just a one piece. Now, it's not to say that if you, had, if you wanted to pay someone who isn't technically exempt a salary, there is a way to do it, but we still have to track their time and we still have to pay them the overtime, the half time. And I've worked with restaurants to do that. There's all different ways we can structure pay. Um, it's just we got to know what you need and we can help you do it. So, any other questions? All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.